In this video, we're going to look at the practice of cyber squatting, and we're going to see how the uniform dispute resolution procedure can be used to counteract this. So, as most of you know, each computer on the internet is identified with a unique identifier known as an IP address. Now, IP addresses are difficult to remember, so we use a system of domain names. So we can have domain names like rte.ie, or cit.ie, or cnn.com. Name servers on the internet look up domain names and provide their corresponding IP addresses so that our browsers then can find those computers on the internet. Domain name registration is quick and easy, and it's not even that expensive. The most popular top-level domain name by far is the .com TLD. But there are other country-specific top-level domains as well that are quite popular. So if you are a business in Ireland, for example, and that Irishness is part of your corporate identity, you might opt for a .ie instead of a .com. There are a lot of top-level domains to choose from, and some have been more successful than others. .info, for example, hasn't really taken off in the marketplace. Cyber squatting is the practice of registering a domain name in bad faith in order to profit from the goodwill of someone else's trademark. So if I noticed, for example, that coca-cola.ie wasn't registered, if I registered that in an attempt to benefit from Coca-Cola's goodwill in the marketplace, that would be cyber squatting. I would register that in the expectation of getting traffic that was intended for Coca-Cola to come to my website. Increasingly, cyber squatting occurs in order to extort money. So if I registered Coca-Cola not with the intention of taking some of the traffic, but just to force Coca-Cola to give me money to relinquish it. That's a different kind of cyber squatting. Typo squatting is quite similar, and that's registering a confusingly similar domain name in the hope of getting traffic for the intended popular website. Sometimes people type really fast, and they might mistype the domain name in the address bar. We're starting to see less of this because fewer people actually type domain names directly into the address bar. And so if you were to misspell Coca-Cola when you go to Google, Google would catch that and present to you the correct site. Now, it can happen that a similar word is used for different classes of product. Now, classes here is the technical term used in trademark law. When you register a trademark, you register it for a particular group of products. You don't register your trademark for all things. And so we have polo cars and we have polo mints. And so if the company that made the mints registered polo.com, the company that owns the car trademark couldn't really complain that much. It's a reasonable thing for them to want to do. Sometimes businesses might spin off and part company, but retain a similar name. So until quite recently, there was a Harrods of Buenos Aires, which initially was connected to Harrods of London, but they spun off a long time ago. So in cases like this, companies can be justified in claiming the right to use the domain name. And that's not cyber squatting. There's no bad faith there. They have a legitimate interest in using that domain name. So in a case where cyber squatting occurs, and where both parties are in the same jurisdiction, the national courts can be used to resolve the dispute. But sometimes the international nature of the internet can complicate the use of national courts. It can be difficult to determine precisely where the case should be heard. 
if someone is cyber squatting in Ireland or in the UK, the law of passing off can be applied to domain names. And the law of passing off has been applied to domain names. But going to court is expensive. And often cyber squatters quite cleverly will look for small amounts of money, knowing that it's cheaper to buy them off than to go to court. The Uniform Dispute Resolution Procedure was developed to make it easier for trademark owners to take control of domain names away from cyber squatters. So anyone registering a domain name actually agrees to submit to this procedure in the event of a complaint. It's in there in the terms and conditions that you probably didn't even read. But anyone who registers a domain name agrees to submit to this process. So here's what you agree to if you register a .ie domain name. The registrant shall submit the following disputes to IEDR's Alternative Dispute Resolution Proceedings and accepts in this regard the competence of the WIPO as an accredited dispute resolution entity. So the WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Organization, and this is a service that they offer. The registrant accepts that those proceedings shall be conducted by WIPO in accordance with the procedures on the website of IEDR. The procedure will be conducted in the English language. Every dispute will be governed by the dispute resolution policy applicable when the complaint is filed. So if you register a .ie domain name, you are agreeing that in the event of a dispute, you will accept the competence of the WIPO to make a judgment in that dispute. Now, any trademark holder can lodge a complaint against a domain name owner. And that trademark can be registered or unregistered. And that's important. The complaint can be lodged with any of the approved dispute resolution providers for that top-level domain name. So the .ie registrar has nominated the WIPO for that purpose, but there are others. The Czech Arbitration Court provides UDRP services for the .eu top-level domain name. The Asian Domain Name Dispute Resolution Centre is often used by Asian companies. There's the National Arbitration Forum in the US. But the WIPO is one of the lead providers for UDRP. So if you've registered a domain name and a trademark owner complains, you can lose control of your domain name if the complainant can establish these three things. That your domain name is identical or confusingly similar to a trademark in which the complainant has rights that you yourself have no rights or legitimate interests in the domain name, and that your domain name has been registered or is being used in bad faith. So these three criteria must be met before the trademark owner can take control of the domain name from you. Now, it may be that you have a legitimate interest in the domain name, and you can establish this by your use or preparations to use the domain name or a name corresponding to the domain name in connection with the offering of goods and services. So if you've been using the name in connection with your trade, well, then you have a legitimate interest in that name. And the fact that somebody else somewhere thinks that they should have the domain name isn't enough to have it taken away from you if you yourself have a legitimate interest. So you could demonstrate this, for example, with a listing in the yellow pages or publicity materials, newspaper ads. You just need to be able to show that you have been using this name in the course of your business. Now, you can also establish your legitimate interest in the domain name if you are making a legitimate, non-commercial or fair use of the domain name, 
without intent for commercial gain to misleadingly divert customers or to tarnish the trademark at issue. So this could apply, for example, to a non-commercial fan site for a particular product. That might be a legitimate use. We've come across the idea of fair use before. And if you're not making money off of it, and you're not harming the trademark, then you might be okay. You might be able to establish that you have a legitimate interest. This is becoming increasingly difficult, however. Here are the reference numbers for some UDRP cases that have been heard at the WIPO. And we can see in all of these that the complainant's efforts to establish all three criteria have been met. EasyJet, for example, was able to establish that EasyJet was similarly confusing to its trademark. It was pretty much identical. It was able to establish that Harding had no legitimate interest in using that name. And it was able to establish that the domain name had been registered or was being used in bad faith. So you can go take a look at the WIPO website and see these cases or other cases. They're all available to the public and very well indexed. The UDRP has posed problems for SOX sites, as they're known. So where people want to use a trademark in a domain name for criticism, that is a legitimate freedom of expression, free speech right. So if someone wants to have a website McDonald's Socks, for example, or FordSocks.com. There's a conflict here between the rights of the trademark owner and the free speech rights of those who want to criticize the company. Increasingly, the UDRP is being used to silence this kind of criticism. It's being argued, for example, that a non-native English speaker might not understand that Ford Socks is obviously not from the Ford Motor Company, and so therefore might take traffic away from Ford.com, or might mistakenly be believed to be a website from Ford. Now that is quite a weak argument in my opinion, because the threshold for confusion is some notional person on the internet with very poor English language skills. And so with that logic, the threshold can be arbitrarily low. But we are finding that in more and more cases, the UDRP is being used to shut down suck sites. Because the Uniform Dispute Resolution Procedure is so convenient and so efficient and so much cheaper than going to court, sometimes a trademark owner initiates proceedings against a domain name holder with legitimate rights to the domain name. So sometimes the trademark owner triggers the UDRP in the full knowledge that the person who has the domain name is perfectly entitled to have it. This is known as a reverse domain name hijack. Initially, the intent was that a finding of a reverse domain name hijack was going to be quite a serious thing and would be a major embarrassment for a company. When some UDRP providers were initially setting up, they even considered barring trademark owners from triggering the process for a certain period of time if a finding of a reverse domain name hijack was logged against them. We can see an example of a reverse domain name hijack at the WIPO, in this case here. This was a case involving Kiwi.com. You can go and have a look at the details there. Judgments in UDRP cases are mercifully short, so it's easy to go have a look and read the details. Now, UDRP outcomes have been criticised for being inconsistent sometimes. And this is illustrated by a series of cases from 2000 when an unhappy customer of Quark Motors registered a number of domain names and used them to complain about the business. Quark Motors used the UDRP to take control of those domain names. 
But despite identical facts, the decisions for the domain names were inconsistent. Some were transferred and some were not. So on the 29th of June, for example, Quirk Nissan was transferred. And so that was taken off the person who had registered it. On the 11th of July, however, Quirk Chevrolet, Quirk Oldsmobile, Quirk Kia, Quirk Autos and Quirk Motors were not transferred. The person who registered those was allowed to keep them. But soon after, on the 30th of July, Quirk Volkswagen was transferred. Now, each of these decisions were made on the same basic facts. And so this suggests that the rules were being interpreted slightly differently by different UDRP panellists. Some people have also argued that the UDRP isn't entirely fair. Now, any trademark holder can lodge a complaint against a domain name owner. Once a complaint is lodged, the domain name owner must act within a certain time frame. However, the trademark owner has plenty of time in advance of the process to prepare a case. So the domain name owner may be under time pressure where the trademark owner is not. Furthermore, a trademark owner can always choose to go to court instead, but the domain name owner has to submit to the UDRP. So the trademark owner has a choice, but the domain name owner doesn't. And so where it's possible that the courts would come to a different decision than the UDRP, the trademark owner can choose to go to court. But the domain name owner can't make that choice. Now, a UDRP case can be decided by a panel of one or three members. Some researchers have claimed that three-member panels are more likely to find in favour of domain name holders than trademark owners. If a complaint is filed against a domain name holder, the domain name holder can opt for a three-person panel instead of a one-person panel, but that costs more money. Now, if the three-member panels are more likely to find in favour of domain name owners, then this skews the balance in favour of those with more money. So that seems unfair. So Michael Geist at the University of Ottawa published a very controversial analysis of UDRP cases. And this led to quite a lot of discussion about whether the UDRP is fair or not. There is also an underlying design flaw in the UDRP system. Dispute resolution providers are commercial operations. They're in this for the money. Now, some of them operate on a non-profit basis, but they still need money to keep going. And for some domain names, the trademark owners have a choice of providers. So for a .eu domain, for example, the trademark holder can decide whether the dispute is heard at the WIPO or at the Czech Court of Arbitration. The domain name holder has no choice. It's entirely up to the trademark owner where the dispute is resolved. So this means that there is an incentive built into the system for dispute resolution providers to decide in favour of trademark owners. If one UDRP provider is more inclined to find in favour of trademark owners than domain name holders under the same circumstances, then there's an incentive for trademark owners to choose that provider. This could result in such providers getting more and more market share. And UDRP providers that enforce the rules very rigorously and strictly, and so perhaps find less often in favour of the trademark owners, might lose market share. And they might even go out of business. So e-resolution, a Canadian company, quit the business claiming that its competitors gained market share by 
tilting the balance in favour of trademark holders. And you can see how there is a commercial incentive there to do that. Now, we don't have any hard evidence that this is the case, but it certainly does tip the balance in favour of the trademark owners, and the system could evolve into one that is unfair. The only protection we could have against the system evolving this way is if domain name holders had resource to the courts. So if the decisions of UDRP providers were consistently being overturned by the courts, that might be a sign that something was wrong. But of course, domain name owners can't appeal to the courts. They are required to be bound by the decisions of the UDRP providers. So if the UDRP system was to go astray and to drift too far in the other direction, trademark owners would still have the option of going to court to resolve their problems. But domain name owners can't. So in summary then, if we go back to the main criteria, you can lose your domain name if it's identical or confusingly similar to a trademark or service mark in which the complainant has rights. If you have no rights or legitimate interest in the same name and your domain name has been registered and being used in bad faith. If these th three criteria can be established, then you can lose control of your domain name.